analyst, a title that many of us have or will hold at some point in the future, whether our background is in econ, finance, information systems, or even in some cases, software engineering. The importance of this role continues to grow as companies aim to become more data-driven and just more data literate. Mm -hmm. IBM has predicted that about 2.7 million jobs will be added in the whole data science, data analytics space over the next few years. And it's just a very common role for many people to get out of college because the skill set most relates to skills that we've learned. Everything from problem solving to Excel to maybe, if you're lucky, some SQL. Of course, I think it goes without saying that today's data analysts looks very different from the ones that I used to work with, where nowadays I'm seeing data analysts who understand things like Python, R, and a few other tools that personally for me were more limited to like a data science space. And so I will say that analysts are becoming more technically capable with a broad range of tools and with a salary that can range anywhere from 60 to 80K, maybe starting out early on, or in some cases, at least according to this YouTuber's thumbnail, 170K, analysts have the opportunity to have a great salary while also making a great impact at the company they work at. And of course, all of these technical skills are great. You know, we're all picking up a lot of cool new skills. There's a lot of cool new tooling that makes all of our lives just easier, whether you're a data engineer or a data analyst. But at the end of the day, when it comes to business value, technical skills are merely half the battle. And there are a lot of other things that I wish I would have known when I first started my first analyst role that would have made me a more effective analyst. And of course, no one teaches a basic analyst course in college because for some reason that never seemed important to any of our professors. So I wanted to give you a few tips on how you can be a better analyst and truly drive value at your company. And this is if you're using Excel or the fanciest new tool that everyone's talking about. It really is regardless of these things because at the end of the day, these are just tools and what you drive in a business value perspective is where the value comes from. So let's dig into the value you can drive. The very first tip that I would recommend for anyone becoming an analyst is set up a clear data analytics process. Now, this was never discussed with me. You know, whenever I was asked a question at my first job, I kind of just would go at it and write some queries and not really have a clear set of boundaries. I didn't really necessarily know or always set the goal. I kind of would just try to answer the question the best that I could. Now, I believe Career Foundry has put together a very simplistic visual for you that you can understand kind of what you should be doing in terms of a basic analytics process. And here it is. You will first want to define the question and or the goal of what you're doing. You know, make sure you work with your stakeholder to understand what exactly they want. So what are the questions that you're gonna ask and what's the goal? Like, what are you actually trying to drive from a business perspective? Next, you're gonna to have to spend some time collecting data. You know, you're gonna work with people like data engineers, uh, maybe some DBAs if those are still around and different kind of roles like that to gather all this data from all the various sources. Following that, you're gonna to to spend some time cleaning and standardizing the data. Usually this is done in Excel, but now there are plenty of people who use uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which is exciting. Uh, then you'll spend some time analyzing the data, which this can mean a ton of different things. You might take this down step by step where you do some sort of exploratory data analysis step, uh, followed by after that, a more concrete kind of approach where you, where you list out some more smaller, maybe like mini questions, so to speak, that will help you answer your larger question. Just something that helps you one, understand the data, and then two, something that helps you actually drive uh, answers to those questions. Now, at the end of this, you're gonna have tons and tons of charts and pivot tables and whatever other things that you did, depending on, again, the tool that you use, and it's gonna be all of these artifacts. So now what you need to do is somehow pick a few and just concisely create a story with them, you know, visualize it, share your findings. And this kind of leads me to my next tip that I have, you know, after having this analytical process that helps you kind of clearly make a framework for how you go from point A to the end of a project, and just really quickly, why this is important is because it is so easy with any form of analysis to just kind of do this infinite analysis that doesn't necessarily have a clear endpoint. So having a framework kind of just makes it easy for you to know when you're done with certain steps. And then if you, for example, need to go deeper into a certain section, you can relay that information to your manager more clearly because you know where you're at. Now you can tell them where you're at. But let's get back to my main point, which was, okay, you've done this analysis, you've got all this data, you've got all this artifacts, you've got all these like charts and all these things, and what am I supposed to make of this, right? Like this, all of this words and numbers and, and charts become messy. And it's important that you don't bury the lead. 
which is spelled L-E-D-E, not L-E-A-D, which is what I originally thought. It's important for you to have some sort of clear message and be concise in that messaging. Whatever your report is, whatever it looks like, you know, don't have a crazy amount of charts, have the right amount of charts. The more you can remove, the more you can kind of just concisely use what you are needing versus what you want to show, the more value you can drive, or at least the less confusion you can create. I think what's very tempting as an analyst, and this is someone who's been in this role, is we want to show all the work that we did because we want to prove that we're worth paying money. And Yes, that makes sense, but this temptation needs to kind of be held back because showing every chart might not be valuable. It might not provide to your end story or whatever you're trying to convey. And this can bury the lead with all these other charts that can lead to other questions that have nothing to do with the main question you're trying to answer. So the more you can concisely wrap up your analysis and just state exactly what you mean with a few charts, the better off you will be and the more clear and understanding your audience will have. And so that is kind of the end goal for many analysts. It's not to have a whole plethora of every chart they've done, but instead pick a few charts that really tell the story, make a clear conclusion, and tie it all together with some sort of either report or notebook. Whatever it is in the end, it doesn't necessarily matter as long as it's clear, concise, and to the point. Now, one step I didn't reference in having an analytical process that I think is important, especially as analysts become more technical, is creating some sort of peer review process. This could be having someone review your queries to make sure that they're accurate, or maybe just your general analysis flow, just so everyone kind of pokes holes in your analysis. I think this is especially valuable for younger analysts because one, you can understand what more experienced analysts are looking for in terms of like reporting, as well as kind of get a fresh pair of eyes to look over data. Because like any form of technical kind of work, we just get into this technical flow where we kind of lose track of what exactly we did to get where we're at, especially if we're looking at things over the next day. So I think it's important to have kind of some sort of peer review process that just looks to poke holes in whatever analysis you've done. You know, do some sort of SQL testing or whatever it might be, because this just ensures that your data is more accurate. And this is generally what we mean when we say analysts should add more engineering rigor to their process. Or if you're Sarah Catanzaro, which I hope I said your name right, <laughs> you might say, hear me out. What if engineers adopt some analytical rigor? Um, I really appreciate the flip side of it. Um, honestly, there's a lot that us as engineers can also pick up from analysts in terms of like trying to push more for business understanding and things of that nature. But in the same way, analysts who are becoming more technical could find a lot of value if they start applying some of the engineering rigor that we have. Like for example, doing things like peer review and actually having a process to go from just an analysis that's you know created by one person to sharing it, doing some sort of version control so that as you're creating all these charts, they don't get lost and that way, if you need to repeat some portion or maybe just want to make sure that, you know, whatever you're doing is accurate, you have a way to confirm it. So that's the reason a lot of engineers say this. It's because we believe as tools and data and software are becoming democratized through low code solutions, that there is still a need for rigor in terms of like engineering rigor when building things like dashboards and analysis. But let me not rant on that too long. Now, speaking of engineers, you will often be working with data engineers and DBAs and software engineers who create data sets in multiple different ways. Now, in some companies, you're gonna have pure and pristine data sets, you know, just amazing data sets where nothing could possibly ever go wrong. You know, every piece and every column is 100% accurate, but I am 90% sure that those companies do not exist. So a great tip for anyone is to triple check your data. Just, ju just assume, that whatever data exists, regardless of who made it, has some tendency to be wrong in some way or another. Maybe it's just a single column. Maybe it's a column that, although it's pulled into the front, shouldn't be because it's not accurate or it's not supported well. Um, I've had examples where when I was working as an analyst, there was a column that kind of said like project number. And I would assume that this was like a project ID or something like that. And the funny thing was within a few seconds of analyzing this column, uh, I realized that in some cases, people used it as an ID column. In other cases, people used it as an ID column with a comma so that you could have multiple IDs in one column, which you can imagine 
the difficulties that poses. And still other people thought of it as a budget column. So they were thinking, oh, the amount of money that I have for this project. So especially columns that are free form or fields that are free form, you don't know if it's gonna be right. Actually, one more fun story was I once worked at a company where we were getting in state abbreviation data and you would assume like this type of column would be 100% accurate or at least not have an invalid state, right? Like you'd at least assume that it's not gonna have an invalid state abbreviation because someone on the other side has a dropdown menu, right? And yet we found tons of state abbreviations that did not exist. Um, I also learned about the abbreviations for like Puerto Rico, which is accurate, but there were others that were like completely off, did not exist, were not states that should exist. So just assume that whatever data you're getting has some form of inaccuracy in it. And you need to figure out what it is, why it exists, if you can fix it, and if you should ignore it because it's just completely unfixable. This is very important, especially as you're promising analysis to your stakeholders, because you're gonna look at a data set and assume, oh, look, all of this data is right, and quickly find out that it's not or it's inaccurate, and you know, in order to fix it, it's gonna take four months. So just a quick, Note for anyone starting out, um, don't trust anyone that says their data is 100% accurate because more than likely it's not and there are going to be gaps. And it's just there, it's how it is. I don't think I've worked at any company, whether it's at Facebook, at uh, Healthentic, at a hospital, at um, multiple different companies in terms of consulting where data is always accurate. There are always issues and how much you can fix that and how much you can go back into the source and fix that really makes a huge difference if you can do that. But don't assume it's going to be an easy fix. Now, another important skill that isn't necessarily discussed is knowing when to stop an analysis. And this is kind of partially wrapped up in having an analytics process. You know, you've got some sort of endpoint. And it's important to know, like, when do you end? Because if you don't, it's just so easy to kind of keep going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole, asking new questions that may or may not provide value. So it's always important to kind of make clear distinctions on what you're going to do, what questions you're gonna answer up front. So that way, what you know kind of when an analysis is sort of done, or at least the baseline of it is, and then you can maybe add on to it more in the future based on what your boss needs. Truthfully, the role of analyst is constantly changing. You know, the tools that people get to use are growing every day. You know, there's more of a push for the concept of like an analytics engineer who kind of plays this middle role in between engineering and analyst. And so there's just this constant change in the term analyst and kind of what it means in terms of tooling. But in terms of what we do or what you're trying to drive, I don't think that changes. I think overall, you're trying to analyze data, find insights one way or another, and then communicate those insights to upper management. And if you wanna level up your skills, Yes, work on your technical skills. That will help you process and manage and work with more data in different ways. But you also still need to focus on things like having a clear analytics process, making sure you're concise and not burying the main point or the lead, considering putting in some sort of peer review process to make sure whatever you're doing is accurate, especially as you code more or have more technical kind of work and tooling. And most importantly, just assume that most of your data has some inaccuracies that you need to figure out quickly and not spend a ton of time then analyzing data that either can't be fixed or is just plain wrong. And that wraps up my tips for being better analysts. And I think I said the same thing back somewhere in 2017 that I'm saying now in 2022. So I don't think these have changed. I'd love to hear from you guys. Let me know about your roles, what you're doing, and if you agree with these skills. Thanks so much and see you guys next time. Goodbye.